Section 7 I rose. I could scarcely resist a desire to kiss the hand of the lady in pink, but I felt that to do so would require as much audacity as a forcible abduction of her. My heart beat loud while I counted out to myself, Shall I do it? Shall I not? And then I ceased to ask myself what I ought to do, so as at least to do something. Blindly, hotly, madly, flinging aside all the reasons I had just found to support such action, I seized and raised to my lips the hand she held out to me. Isn't he delicious? Quite a ladies' man already. He takes after his uncle. He'll be a perfect gentleman, she went on, setting her teeth so as to give the word a kind of English accentuation. Couldn't he come to see me some day, for a cup of tea, as our friends across the channel say? He need only send me a blue in the morning. I had not the least idea of what a blue might be. I did not understand half the words which the lady used, but my fear lest there should be concealed in them some question which it would be impolite in me not to answer kept me from withdrawing my close attention from them, and I was beginning to feel extremely tired. No, no, it is impossible, said my uncle, shrugging his shoulders. He has kept busy at home all day. He has plenty of work to do. He brings back all the prizes from his school, he added in a lower tone, so that I should not hear this falsehood and interrupt with a contradiction. You can't tell. He may turn out a little Victor Hugo, a kind of volabel, don't you know? Oh, I love artistic people, replied the lady in pink. There is no one like them for understanding women, them and really nice men like yourself. But please forgive my ignorance. Who? What is Volabel? Is it those gilt books in the little glass case in your drawing-room? You know you promised to lend them to me. I will take great care of them. My uncle, who hated lending people books, said nothing, and ushered me out into the hall. Madly in love with the lady in pink, I covered my old uncle's tobacco-stained cheeks with passionate kisses, and while he, awkwardly enough, gave me to understand, without actually saying, that he would rather I did not tell my parents about this visit. I assured him, with tears in my eyes, that his kindness had made so strong an impression upon me that some day I would most certainly find a way of expressing my gratitude. So strong an impression had it made upon me, that two hours later, after a string of mysterious utterances, which did not strike me as giving my parents a sufficiently clear idea of the new importance with which I had been invested, I found it simpler to let them have a full account, omitting no detail, of the visit I had paid that afternoon. In doing this, I had no thought of causing my uncle any unpleasantness. How could I have thought such a thing, since I did not wish it? and I could not suppose that my parents would see any harm in a visit in which I myself saw none. Every day of our lives, does not some friend or other ask us to make his apologies, without fail, to some woman to whom he has been prevented from writing? And do not we forget to do so, feeling that this woman cannot attach much importance to a silence which has none for ourselves? I imagined, like every one else, that the brains of other people were lifeless and submissive receptacles, with no power of specific reaction to any stimulus which might be applied to them, and I had not the least doubt that when I deposited in the minds of my parents the news of the acquaintance I had made at my uncle's, I should at the same time transmit to them the kindly judgment I myself had based on the introduction. Unfortunately, my parents had recourse to principles entirely different from those which I suggested they should adopt when they came to form their estimate of my uncle's conduct. My father and grandfather had words with him of a violent order, as I learned indirectly. A few days later, 
passing my uncle in the street, as he drove by in an open carriage. I felt at once all the grief, the gratitude, the remorse, which I should have liked to convey to him. Beside the immensity of these emotions, I considered that merely to raise my hat to him would be incongruous and petty and might make him think that I regarded myself as bound to show him no more than the commonest form of courtesy. I decided to abstain from so inadequate a gesture, and turned my head away. My uncle thought that, in doing so, I was obeying my parents' orders. He never forgave them. And though he did not die until many years later, not one of us ever set eyes on him again. And so I no longer used to go into the little sitting-room, now kept shut, of my uncle Adolf. Instead, after hanging about on the outskirts of the back kitchen until Françoise appeared on its threshold and announced, I am going to let the kitchen-maid serve the coffee and take up the hot water. It is time I went off to Madame Octave. I would then decide to go indoors, and would go straight upstairs to my room to read. The kitchen-maid was an abstract personality, a permanent institution to which an invariable set of attributes assured a sort of fixity and continuity and identity throughout the long series of transitory human shapes in which that personality was incarnate. For we never found the same girl there two years running, in the year in which we ate such quantities of asparagus, the kitchen-maid whose duty it was to dress them was a poor, sickly creature, some way gone in pregnancy, when we arrived at Combray for Easter, and it was indeed surprising that Françoise allowed her to run so many errands in the town, and to do so much work in the house, for she was beginning to find a difficulty in bearing before her the mysterious casket fuller and larger every day, whose splendid outline could be detected through the folds of her ample smocks. These last recalled the cloaks in which Giotto shrouds some of the allegorical figures in his paintings, of which Monsieur Swann had given me photographs. He it was who pointed out the resemblance, and when he inquired after the kitchen-maid, he would say, Well, how goes it with Giotto's charity? And indeed, the poor girl, whose pregnancy had swelled and stoutened every part of her, even to her face, and the vertical, squared outlines of her cheeks, did distinctly suggest those virgins, so strong and mannish as to seem matrons rather, in whom the virtues are personified in the arena chapel. And I can see now, that those virtues and vices of Padua resembled her in another respect as well, for just as the figure of this girl had been enlarged by the additional symbol which she carried in her body, without appearing to understand what it meant, without any rendering in her facial expression of all its beauty and spiritual significance, but carried as if it were an ordinary and rather heavy burden, so it is, without any apparent suspicion of what she is about, that the powerfully built housewife, who is portrayed in the arena beneath the label Caritas, and a reproduction of whose portrait hung upon the wall of my schoolroom at Combray, incarnates that virtue. For it seems impossible that any thought of charity can ever have found expression in her vulgar and energetic face. By a fine stroke of the painter's invention, she is tumbling all the treasures of the earth at her feet, but exactly as if she were treading grapes in a wine-press to extract their juice, or, still more, as if she had climbed on a heap of sacks to raise herself higher. And she is holding out her flaming heart to God, or shall we say, handing it to him exactly as a cook might hand up a corkscrew through the skylight of her underground kitchen to someone who had called down to ask her for it from the ground level above. 
the invidia again, should have had some look on her face of envy. But in this fresco, too, the symbol occupies so large a place, and is represented with such realism. The serpent hissing between the lips of envy is so huge, and so completely fills her wide-opened mouth, that the muscles of her face are strained and contorted, like a child's who is filling a balloon with his breath. And that envy, and we ourselves for that matter, when we look at her, since all her attention and ours are concentrated on the action of her lips, have no time, almost, to spare for envious thoughts. Despite all the admiration that Monsieur Swann might profess for these figures of Giotto, it was a long time before I could find any pleasure in seeing in our schoolroom, where the copies he had brought me were hung, that charity devoid of charity, that envy who looked like nothing so much as a plate in some medical book, illustrating the compression of the glottis or uvula by tumour in the tongue, or by the introduction of the operator's instrument, a justice whose greyish and meanly regular features were the very same as those which adorned the faces of certain good and pious and slightly withered ladies of Cambrai, whom I used to see at mass, many of whom had long been enrolled in the reserve forces of injustice. But in later years I understood that the arresting strangeness the special beauty of these frescoes lay in the great part played in each of them by its symbols, while the fact that these were depicted not as symbols, for the thought symbolized was nowhere expressed, but as real things, actually felt or materially handled, added something more precise and more literal to their meaning something more concrete and more striking to the lesson they imparted. And even in the case of the poor kitchen-maid, was not our attention incessantly drawn to her belly by the load which filled it? And in the same way, again, are not the thoughts of men and women in the agony of death often turned towards the practical, painful, obscure, internal, intestinal aspect, towards that seamy side of death, which is, as it happens, the side that death actually presents to them and forces them to feel, a sight which far more closely resembles a crushing burden, a difficulty in breathing, a destroying thirst, than the abstract idea to which we are accustomed to give the name of death. There must have been a strong element of reality in those virtues and vices of Padua, since they appeared to me to be as much alive as the pregnant servant girl, while she herself appeared scarcely less allegorical than they, and, quite possibly, this lack, or seeming lack, of participation by a person's soul in the significant marks of its own special virtue, has, apart from its aesthetic meaning, a reality which, if not strictly psychological, may at least be called physiognomical. Later on, when, in the course of my life, I have had occasion to meet with, in convents, for instance, literally saintly examples of practical charity. They have generally had the brisk, decided, undisturbed, and slightly brutal air of a busy surgeon, the face in which one can discern no commiseration, no tenderness at the sight of suffering humanity, and no fear of hurting it, the face devoid of gentleness or sympathy, the sublime face, of true goodness. Then while the kitchen maid, who all unawares, made the superior qualities of Francoise shine with added lustre, just as error, by force of contrast, enhances the triumph of truth, took in coffee which, according to Mamma, 
was nothing more than hot water, and then carried up to our rooms hot water which was barely tepid. I would be lying stretched out on my bed, a book in my hand, in my room which trembled with the effort to defend its frail, transparent coolness against the afternoon sun, behind its almost closed shutters through which, however, a reflection of the sunlight had contrived to slip in on its golden wings, remaining motionless, between glass and woodwork, in a corner, like a butterfly poised upon a flower. It was hardly light enough for me to read, and my feeling of the day's brightness and splendour was derived solely from the blows struck down below, in the Rue de la Corée, by Camus, whom Françoise had assured that my aunt was not resting, and that he might therefore make a noise. Upon some old packing-cases, from which nothing would really be sent flying but the dust, though the din of them, in the resonant atmosphere that accompanies hot weather, seemed to scatter broadcast a rain of blood-red stars, and from the flies who performed for my benefit in their small concert, as it might be the chamber music of summer, evoking heat and light quite differently from an air of human music which, if you happen to have heard it during a fine summer, will always bring that summer back to your mind. The fly's music is bound to the season by a closer, a more vital tie, born of sunny days, and not to be reborn but with them, containing something of their essential nature. It not merely calls up their image in our memory, but gives us a guarantee that they do really exist, that they are close around us, immediately accessible. This dim freshness of my room was to the broad daylight of the street what the shadow is to the sunbeam, that is to say, equally luminous, and presented to my imagination the entire panorama of summer, which my senses, if I had been out walking, could have tasted and enjoyed in fragments only, and so was quite in harmony with my state of repose, which, thanks to the adventures related in my books, which had just excited it, bore, like a hand reposing motionless in a stream of running water, the shock and animation of a torrent of activity and life. But my grandmother, even if the weather, after growing too hot, had broken, and a storm or just a shower had burst over us, would come up and beg me to go outside. And as I did not wish to leave off my book, I would go on with it in the garden, under the chestnut tree, in a little sentry box of canvas and matting, in the furthest recesses of which I used to sit and feel that I was hidden from the eyes of any one who might be coming to call upon the family. And then my thoughts, did not they form a similar sort of hiding hole, in the depths of which I felt that I could bury myself and remain invisible even when I was looking at what went on outside. When I saw any external object, my consciousness that I was seeing it would remain between me and it, enclosing it in a slender, incorporeal outline which prevented me from ever coming directly in contact with the material form, for it would volatize itself in some way before I could touch it, just as an incandescent body which is moved towards something wet never actually touches moisture, since it has always preceded itself by a zone of evaporation. Upon the sort of screen, patterned with different states and impressions which my consciousness would quietly unfold while I was reading, and which ranged from the most deeply hidden aspirations of my heart, to the wholly external view of the horizon spread out before my eyes at the foot of the garden, what was from the first the most permanent and the most intimate part of me, the lever whose incessant movements controlled all the rest, was my belief in the philosophic richness and beauty of the book I was reading, and my desire to appropriate these to myself, whatever the book might be. For even if I had purchased it at Combray, having seen it outside Boranger's, whose grocery lay too far from our house for Françoise to be able to deal there, as she did with Camus, 
but who enjoyed better custom as a stationer and bookseller. Even if I had seen it, tied with string to keep it in its place in the mosaic of monthly parts and pamphlets which adorned either side of his doorway, a doorway more mysterious, more teeming with suggestion than that of a cathedral, I should have noticed and bought it there simply because I had recognised it as a book which had been well spoken of, in my hearing, by the schoolmaster or the school friend who, at that particular time, seemed to me to be entrusted with the secret of truth and beauty, things half felt by me, half incomprehensible, the full understanding of which was the vague but permanent object of my thoughts. Next to this central belief, which, while I was reading, would be constantly in motion from my inner self to the outer world, towards the discovery of truth, came the emotions aroused in me by the action in which I would be taking part, for these afternoons were crammed with more dramatic and sensational events than occur often in a whole lifetime. These were the events which took place in the book I was reading. It is true that the people concerned in them were not what Françoise would have called real people, but none of the feelings which the joys or misfortunes of a real person awaken in us can be awakened except through a mental picture of those joys or misfortunes, and the ingenuity of the first novelist lay in his understanding that, as the picture was the one essential element in the complicated structure of our emotions, so that simplification of it, which consisted in the suppression, pure and simple, of real people, would be a decided improvement. A real person, profoundly as we may sympathize with him, is in a great measure perceptible only through our senses. That is to say, he remains opaque, offers a dead weight which our sensibilities have not the strength to lift. If some misfortune comes to him, it is only in one small section of the complete idea we have of him that we are capable of feeling any emotion. Indeed, it is only in one small section of the complete idea he has of himself that he is capable of feeling any emotion either. The novelist's happy discovery was to think of substituting for those opaque sections, impenetrable by the human spirit, their equivalent in immaterial sections, things, that is, which the spirit can assimilate to itself. After which it matters not that the actions, the feelings of this new order of creatures, appear to us in the guise of truth, since we have made them our own, since it is on ourselves that they are happening that they are holding in thrall, while we turn over feverishly the pages of the book, our quickened breath and staring eyes. And once the novelist has brought us to that state, in which, as in all purely mental states, every emotion is multiplied tenfold, into which his book comes to disturb us as might a dream, but a dream more lucid and of a more lasting impression than those which come to us in sleep. Why then, for the space of an hour, he sets free within us all the joys and sorrows in the world, a few of which, only, we should have to spend years of our actual life in getting to know, and the keenest, the most intense of which would never have been revealed to us, because the slow course of their development stops our perception of them. It is the same in life. The heart changes and that is our worst misfortune. But we learn of it only from reading or by imagination, for in reality its alteration, like that of certain natural phenomena, is so gradual that, even if we are able to distinguish successively each of its different states, we are still spared the actual sensation of change. Next to but distinctly less intimate a part of myself than this human element, would come the view, more or less projected before my eyes, of the country in which the action of the story was taking place, which made a far stronger impression on my mind than the other, 
the actual landscape which would meet my eyes when I raised them from my book. In this way, for two consecutive summers, I used to sit in the heat of our Combray garden, sick with a longing inspired by the book I was then reading, for a land of mountains and rivers, where I could see an endless vista of sawmills, where beneath the limpid currents fragments of wood lay mouldering in beds of watercress, and nearby, rambling and clustering along low walls, purple flowers and red. And since there was always lurking in my mind the dream of a woman who would enrich me with her love, that dream in those two summers used to be quickened with the freshness and coolness of running water, and whoever she might be, the woman whose image I call to mind, purple flowers and red would at once spring up on either side of her, like complementary colours. This was not only because an image of which we dream remains for ever distinguished, is adorned and enriched by the association of colours not its own, which may happen to surround it in our mental picture. For the scenes in the books I read were to me not merely scenery more vividly portrayed by my imagination than any which Combray could spread before my eyes, but otherwise of the same kind. Because of the selection that the author had made of them, because of the spirit of faith in which my mind would exceed and anticipate his printed word, as it might be interpreting a revelation, these scenes used to give me the impression, one which I hardly ever derived from any place in which I might happen to be, and never from our garden, that undistinguished product of the strictly conventional fantasy of the gardener whom my grandmother so despised, of their being actually part of nature herself, and worthy to be studied and explored. Had my parents allowed me, when I read a book, to pay a visit to the country it described, I should have felt that I was making an enormous advance towards the ultimate conquest of truth. For even if we have the sensation of being always enveloped in, surrounded by our own soul, still it does not seem a fixed and immovable prison. Rather do we seem to be borne away with it, and perpetually struggling to pass beyond it, to break out into the world, with a perpetual discouragement as we hear endlessly, all around us, that unvarying sound which is no echo from without, but the resonance of a vibration from within. We try to discover in things, endeared to us on that account, the spiritual glamour which we ourselves have cast upon them. We are disillusioned, and learn that they are in themselves barren, and devoid of the charm which they owed, in our minds to the association of certain ideas. Sometimes we mobilize all our spiritual forces in a glittering array, so as to influence and subjugate other human beings who, as we very well know, are situated outside ourselves, where we can never reach them. And so, if I always imagined the woman I loved, as in a setting of whatever places I most longed at the time to visit, if in my secret longings it was she who attracted me to them, who opened to me the gate of an unknown world, that was not by the mere hazard of a simple association of thoughts. No, it was because my dreams of travel and of love were only moments which I isolate artificially today, as though I were cutting sections at different heights in a jet of water, rainbow flashing, but seemingly without flow or motion, were only drops in a single, undeviating, irresistible outrush of all the forces of my life. And then, as I continue to trace the outward course of these impressions from their close-packed intimate source in my consciousness, and before I come to the horizon of reality which envelops them, I discover pleasures of another kind, those of being comfortably seated, of tasting the good scent on the air, of not being disturbed by any visitor. And, when an hour chimed from the steeple of Saint-Hilaire, of watching what was already spent of the afternoon fall drop by drop, until I heard the last stroke 
which enabled me to add up the total sum. After which the silence that followed seemed to herald the beginning, in the blue sky above me, of that long part of the day still allowed me for reading, until the good dinner which Françoise was even now preparing should come to strengthen and refresh me, after the strenuous pursuit of its hero, through the pages of my book. And, as each hour struck, it would seem to me that a few seconds only had passed since the hour before. The latest would inscribe itself, close to its predecessor, on the sky's surface, and I would be unable to believe that sixty minutes could be squeezed into the tiny arc of blue which was comprised between their two golden figures. Sometimes it would even happen that this precocious hour would sound two strokes more than the last. There must then have been an hour which I had not heard strike. Something which had taken place had not taken place for me. The fascination of my book, a magic as potent as the deepest slumber, had stopped my enchanted ears, and had obliterated the sound of that golden bell from the azure surface of the enveloping silence. Sweet Sunday afternoons, beneath the chestnut tree in our Combray garden, from which I was careful to eliminate every commonplace incident of my actual life, replacing them by a career of strange adventures and ambitions in a land watered by living streams. You still recall those adventures and ambitions to my mind when I think of you, and you embody and preserve them by virtue of having little by little drawn round and enclosed them, while I went on with my book and the heat of the day declined. In the gradual crystallization, slowly altering in form and dappled with a pattern of chestnut leaves, of your silent, sonorous, fragrant, limpid hours. Sometimes I would be torn from my book, in the middle of the afternoon, by the gardener's daughter, who came running like a mad thing, overturning an orange tree in its tub, cutting her finger, breaking her tooth, and screaming out, They're coming! They're coming! so that Françoise and I should run too, and not miss anything of the show. That was on days when the cavalry stationed in Compray went out for some military exercise, going as a rule by the Rue Saint-Hildegarde, while our servants, sitting in a row on their chairs outside the garden railings, stared at the people of Compray taking their Sunday walks, and were stared at in return. The gardener's daughter, through the gap which there was between two houses far away in the avenue de la Gare, would have spied the glitter of helmets. The servants then hurried in with their chairs, for when the troopers fell through the Rue saint Hildegarde, they filled it from side to side, and their jostling horses scraped against the walls of the houses, covering and drowning the pavements, like banks which present too narrow a channel to a river in flood. Poor children! Françoise would exclaim, in tears, almost before she had reached the railings, "'Poor boys, to be mown down like grass in a meadow! It's just shocking to think of!' She would go on, laying a hand over her heart, where presumably she had felt the shock. "'A fine sight, isn't it, Madame Françoise? All these young fellows not caring two straws for their lives?' the gardener would ask, just to draw her and he would not have spoken in vain. "'Not caring for their lives, is it? Why, what in the world is there that we should care for, if it's not our lives? The only gift the Lord never offers us a second time. Oh, dear, oh, dear, you're right all the same. It's quite true they don't care. I can remember them in seventy. In those wretched wars they've no fear of death left in them. They're nothing more nor less than madmen and then they aren't worth the price of a rope to hang them with. They're not men any more. They're lions. For by her way of thinking, to compare a man with a lion, which he used to pronounce lion, was not at all complimentary to the man. The Rue saint Hildegarde turned too sharply for us to be able to see people approaching at any distance. 
and it was only through the gap between those two houses in the Avenue de la Gare that we could still make out fresh helmets racing along towards us and flashing in the sunlight. The gardener wanted to know whether there were still many to come, and he was thirsty besides, with the sun beating down upon his head. So then, suddenly, his daughter would leap out, as though from a beleaguered city, would make a sortie, turn the street corner, and, having risked her life a hundred times over, reappear and bring us, with a jug of licorice water, the news that there were still at least a thousand of them, pouring along without a break from the direction of Thibazy and Maiseglise. Francoise and the gardener, having made up their difference, would discuss the line to be followed in case of war. "'Don't you see, Francoise?' he would say. "'Revolution would be better, because then no one would need to join in unless he liked. "'Oh, yes, I can see that, certainly. It's more straightforward.' The gardener believed that, as soon as war was declared, they would stop all the railways. "'Yes, to be sure, so that we shan't get away,' said Francoise. And the gardener would assent with, "'Aye, they're the cunning ones.' For he would not allow that war was anything but a kind of trick which the state attempted to play on the people, or that there was a man in the world who would not run away from it if he had the chance to do so. But Francoise would hasten back to my aunt, and I would return to my book, and the servants would take their places again outside the gate to watch the dust settle on the pavement, and the excitement caused by the passage of the soldiers subside. Long after order had been restored, an abnormal tide of humanity would continue to darken the streets of Cambrai, and in front of every house, even of those where it was not, as a rule, done, the servants, and sometimes even the masters, would sit and stare, festooning their doorsteps with a dark, irregular fringe, like the border of shells and seaweed which a stronger tide than usual leaves on the beach, as though trimming it with embroidered crepe when the sea itself has retreated. Except on such days as these, however, I would as a rule be left to read in peace, but the interruption which a visit from Swan once made, and the commentary which he then supplied to the course of my reading, which had brought me to the work of an author quite new to me, called Bergot, had this definite result that for a long time afterwards it was not against a wall gay with spikes of purple blossom, but on a wholly different background, the porch of a Gothic cathedral, that I would see outlined the figure of one of the women of whom I dreamed. I had heard Begot spoken of, for the first time, by a friend older than myself, for whom I had a strong admiration, a precious youth, of the name of Bloch. Hearing me confess my love of the Nuit d'Octobre, he had burst out in a bray of laughter, like a bugle call, and told me, by way of warning, you must conquer your vile taste for A. de Musset, Esquire. He is bad egg, one of the very worst, a pretty detestable specimen. I'm bound to admit, nevertheless, he added graciously, that he, and even the man Racine, did, each of them, once in his life, compose a line which is not only fairly rhythmical, but has also what is in my eyes the supreme merit of meaning absolutely nothing. One is... La Blanche Olesun et la Blanche Camille, and the other, La Fille de Minos et de Pacifie. They were submitted to my judgment, as evidence for the defence of the two runagates, in an article by my very dear master, Father Le Comte, who is found pleasing in the sight of the immortal gods. By which token, here is a book which I have not the time just now to read, a book recommended, it was seen, by that colossal fellow, he regards, or so they tell me, its author, one Bergot, Esquire, as a subtle scribe, more subtle indeed than any beast of the field, and albeit he exhibits on occasion a critical pacificism, a tenderness in suffering fools, for which it is impossible to account, and hard to make allowance, still his word has weight with me as it were the Delphic oracle. Read you then this lyrical prose, and if the titanic master-builder of rhythm who composed Bhagavat, and the Levriere de Magnus, speaks not falsely, 
Then by Apollo you may taste, even you, my master, the ambrosial joys of Olympus. It was in an ostensible vein of sarcasm that he had asked me to call him, and that he himself called me, my master. But, as a matter of fact, we each derived a certain amount of satisfaction from the mannerism, being still at the age in which one believes that one gives a thing real existence by giving it a name. Unfortunately, I was not able to set at rest by further talks with Bloch, in which I might have insisted upon an explanation, the doubts he had engendered in me when he told me that fine lines of poetry, from which I, if you please, expected nothing less than the revelation of truth itself, were all the finer if they meant absolutely nothing. For, as it happened, Bloch was not invited to the house again. At first he had been well received there. It is true that my grandfather made out that, whenever I formed a strong attachment to any one of my friends, and brought him home with me, that friend was invariably a Jew, to which he would not have objected on principle. Indeed, his own friend Swan was of Jewish extraction. Had he not found that the Jews whom I chose as friends were not usually of the best type? And so I was hardly ever able to bring a new friend home without my grandfather's humming the O God of our fathers from La Juive, or else Israel break thy chain, singing the tune alone, of course, to an um ti tum ti tum tra la But I used to be afraid of my friends recognising the sound, and so being able to reconstruct the words. Before seeing them, merely on hearing their names, about which, as often as not, there was nothing particularly Hebraic, he would divine not only the Jewish origin of such my friends as might indeed be of the chosen people, but even some dark secret which was hidden in their family. And what do they call your friend who is coming this evening? Dumont, Grandpapa. Dumont. Oh, I'm afraid of Dumont. And he would sing, Archers, be on your guard. Watch without rest, without sound. And then, after a few adroit questions on points of detail, he would call out, On guard! On guard! Or, if it were the victim himself who had already arrived, and had been obliged unconsciously by my grandfather's subtle examination to admit his origin, then my grandfather, to show us that he had no longer any doubts, would merely look at us, humming almost inaudibly the air of, What? Do you hither guide the feet? Of this timid Israelite, or of sweet vale of Hebron, dear paternal fields, or perhaps of yes, I am of the chosen race. These little eccentricities on my grandfather's part implied no ill will whatsoever towards my friends. But Bloch had displeased my family for other reasons. He had begun by annoying my father, who, Seeing him come in with wet clothes, had asked him with keen interest, Why, Monsieur Bloch, is there a change in the weather? Has it been raining? I can't understand it. The barometer has been set fair. Which drew for Bloch nothing more instructive than, Sir, I am absolutely incapable of telling you whether it has rained. I live so resolutely apart from physical contingencies that my sense is no longer troubled to inform me of them. My poor boy! said my father after Bloch had gone. Your friend is out of his mind. Why, he couldn't even tell me what the weather was like. As if there could be anything more interesting. He is an imbecile. Next, Bloch had displeased my grandmother because, after luncheon, when she complained of not feeling very well, he had stifled a sob and wiped the tears from his eyes. You cannot imagine that he is sincere, she observed to me. Why, he doesn't know me. "'unless he's mad, of course. "'And finally he had upset the whole household "'when he arrived an hour and a half late for luncheon, "'and covered with mud from head to foot, "'and made not the least apology, "'saying merely, "'I never allow myself to be influenced in the smallest degree "'either by atmospheric disturbances "'or by the arbitrary divisions of what is known as time. 
I would willingly reintroduce to society the opium pipe of China, or the Malayan chris, but I am wholly and entirely without instruction in those infinitely more pernicious, besides being quite bleakly bourgeois, implements, the umbrella, and the watch. In spite of all this, he would still have been received at Combray. He was, of course, hardly the friend my parents would have chosen for me. They had, in the end, decided that the tears which he had shed on hearing of my grandmother's illness were genuine enough. But they knew, either instinctively or from their own experience, that our early impulsive emotions had but little influence over our later actions and the conduct of our lives, and that regard for moral obligations, loyalty to our friends, patience in finishing our work, obedience to a rule of life, have a surer foundation, in habits solidly formed and blindly followed, than in these momentary transports, ardent but sterile. They would have preferred to block, as companions for myself, boys who would have given me no more than it is proper, by all the laws of middle-class morality, for boys to give one another, who would not unexpectedly send me a basket of fruit because they happened, that morning, to have thought of me with affection, but who, since they were incapable of inclining in my favour, by any single impulse of their imagination and emotions, the exact balance of the duties and claims of friendship, were as incapable of loading the scales to my prejudice. Even the injuries we do them will not easily divert from the path of their duty towards us those conventional natures of which my great-aunt furnished a type who, after quarrelling for years with a niece, to whom she never spoke again, yet made no change in the will in which she had left that niece the whole of her fortune, because she was her next of kin, and it was the proper thing to do. But I was fond of Bloch. My parents wished me to be happy, and the insoluble problems which I set myself on such texts as the absolutely meaningless beauty of la fille de Minos et de Pacifi tired me more, and made me more unwell, than I should have been after further talks with him, unwholesome as those talks might seem to my mother's mind. And he would still have been received at Combray, but for one thing. That same night, after dinner, having informed me, a piece of news which had a great influence on my later life, making it happier at one time, and then more unhappy, that no woman ever thought of anything but love, and that there was not one of them whose resistance a man could not overcome. He had gone on to assure me that he had heard it said, on unimpeachable authority, that my great-aunt herself had led a gay life in her younger days, and had been notoriously kept. I could not refrain from passing on so important a piece of information to my parents. The next time Bloch called, he was not admitted. And afterwards, when I met him in the street, he greeted me with extreme coldness. But in the matter of Bergot, he had spoken truly. End of section 7